Um, I like to. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, wait a minute. I've got a box on my screen. Hi, Tom. Hello. Hi. How are you? Just fine, thanks. Um, Good. I'd like to welcome everybody who is with us, uh, Kiwanians and guests. Um, and uh, we have some announcements to make. First of all, I'd like to, for all of us to appreciate um, a couple of our members who are celebrating Kiwanis anniversaries uh, this week. Bob Gardner, 27 years, and Nancy Swagonski, six years. Um, also, um, next announcement <coughs> is at semi-annual dues for April through September 30th will be sent out <laughs> thanks to oh, all of you for your commitment to Kiwanis and all of us as Kiwanians do for the children of our community and elsewhere. Um, our 76th annual state basketball finals lunch was so amazing on Friday. Our first one since 2019, so it was especially special. Uh, the Kiwanis uh, Foundation of Indianapolis presented five scholarships to the top academic basketball scholars in Marion County. And since 1991, um, more than $170,000 has been awarded to 155 student athletes through the support of the foundation. And this includes annual awards um, Jim Mills family was in attendance to congratulate the $1,500 Memorial Scholarship recipient, recipient Dagan Knight, a senior at Perry Meridian, with a, a 4.486 weighted GPA and who scored 1480 on the SAT. I would hate to compare that to what, whatever mine was that I don't remember. Uh, we also extended $1,000 academic scholarships to da uh, Davis Olson from North Central, uh, Ben Wright, Bishop Chittard, Rice Walker from Speedway, and Luke Hearn, a member of the state champion cathedral team. Thanks to the leadership of David Wright and Mike Halstead and their committee, Jim Dubois, Steve Farrow, Graham Honecker, Chris Kaufman, and Trina Rodebush, and thanks to Eric and Lamika Steele for the fun giveaways at the end of the uh, of the luncheon. That was that was really special. Thanks a lot, Erica, Eric and uh, Lamika. That was fun. We were also joined by key players in the city and our partnerships with the Pacers and IHSAA, who made this a great event. Quinn Buckner offered advice to the teams. Pacer photographer Kai, uh, Matt Krieger and sideline reporter Jeremiah Johnson were also at our lunch and then on the court covering the games on Saturday. Um, and Indiana sports talk host Bob Lovell uh, joined us again to interview IHSAA commissioner and Kiwanian Paul Nydick and the final eight coaches along with a key player uh, these outstanding uh, players are role models, and several received IHSAA Mental Attitude Awards. Award-winning sports reporter Kyle Nadenreich served as MC and wrote about us under the title IHSAA Basketball, wrapping up the 2021-22 season from A to Z. And here is what he wrote, K is for Kiwanis. I appreciate the Kiwanis Club for asking me to host the state finals luncheon the Friday before the games. I have hosted the postseason football luncheon for several years. The Kiwanis Club makes that a special day for a lot of people. It's fun to see those athletes recognized for their athletic and academic achievements. Um, and still, stay, still staying on the on the. Um, item of the um, of our luncheon for honoring the athletes. I'd like to say that our um, that our own Kelly um, Olis was very instrumental in making that that luncheon an absolute wonderful success. Kelly. Yeah, Kelly. Put incredible numbers of hours into the um, um, into the organization and and um, 
she she deserves a, a, a huge applause for what she what she was able to accomplish behind the scenes. So thanks, Kelly, from all of us. Um, as you know, uh, the International Convention is coming to Indianapolis um, between June 8th and June 11. Uh, be sure to sign up to attend and um, and even volunteer as an airport greeter or perhaps at the welcome desk. The link to sign up is in the chat box. The Indiana District is hosting a fun social on Friday, June 10 at the Slippery Noodle. So sign up before all, our all those tickets are sold out. Now Trina will share, a, share with us an update on our next few meetings. Trina? Thank you. Uh, next week is going to be an incredibly special and moving uh, meeting. David Wright and Brad Boyd from um, our Qantas office are going to talk about um, the situation in Ukraine, the refugees on the ground, their needs, their experiences. Uh, David's organization has been on the ground in Europe um, doing quite a bit of work. So uh, it'll give us some some insights that we're not getting elsewhere. So please encourage folks to, to come to that, uh, members, guests, um, whoever needs to be moved. Uh, April 15th, filmmaker Jerry Harkness will join us by Zoom. He's taking time out of shooting on location uh, to do that. April 21st, we're gonna hear from some of our service leadership uh, partners, Key Club, Circle K, all of the ways that we're impacting youth in Indy through those programs. May 5th is Indiana Tourism Week. Susie Townsend from Visit Indy and Carrie Lambert from the Indiana Tourism Association are gonna join us. A uh, Couple special ones and huge thank you to Kelly for making connections on these. May 19th, the Sym Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra will be joining us, specifically talking about Symphony on the Prairie, uh, but certainly everything going on with the ISO. Uh, we've got Julie Locke on June 16th, the Commissioner of the Horizon League uh, that's housed in Indianapolis. And then one that I am most excited about, uh, the Children's Museum will join us on June 30th to talk about their new Dinosphere exhibit. Um, all of this is on our website, indiquanus.org, uh, as well as links to register for the meetings or connect via Zoom. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Trina. Um, Graham is now going to uh, introduce to us our speaker for the day, uh, Dan Grunfield. Um, do we have Graham? I'm here. Excellent. And uh, yes, it is an honor to introduce Dan. I do want to point out a couple guests that we have, though. First, we have uh, Dr. Alex Kaur, a great friend of mine, and I really appreciate the the club who's been so supportive of our efforts around honoring Alex's mom, Eva, who many of you know, uh, a Holocaust survivor, well known for her stance on forgiveness. We've had several programs. And uh, so Alex, thank you for joining us. I apologize earlier for my comments on your defensive abilities, though they were true. Uh, we have Tom Crowley, uh, a great friend of mine and former colleague. He worked as an associate athletic director here at Butler for a number of years. Tom played at the uh, University of Pennsylvania on, on some of their best basketball teams in the late 1970s. And then we have Dr. Chris Schinkman. So Dan, I don't know if you know, but Dr. Schinkman was very, very involved with the Cardinal Club for many years uh, at Stanford, and he is calling in from DC. The great thing about Dr. Schinkman is he's also an adopted uh, Butler alum as well. So I wanted to welcome the guest. And again, it's a real honor to introduce Dan here. This is a program I've been looking forward to for a long time. I, I read his book not too long ago. And before I introduce him, we are gonna be placing a bulk order in the club. Kelly put me down for the first two books. And if you're interested, um, before we place the order, please email Kelly. I think you'll be inspired by this presentation. And, and Dan will say it better than I do, but this is a book that basketball is only the foundation. You know, again, the, the lessons from this book are very powerful. And so put me down for the first two, Kelly, and, and um, again, let her know 
your order, how many books you want to order. Um, if there's another book on basketball you're looking for, we can talk offline. Uh, I can talk to you about my upcoming books. This is about Dan. <laughs> uh, so it's an honor to introduce Dan Grunfeld. He's a uh, professional basketball player, accomplished writer, proud graduate and player at Stanford University, played on some really good teams there. He was an academic All-American, all-conference basketball selection at Stanford. He's played professionally for eight seasons uh, around the world, including Germany, Spain, and Israel. Uh, Dan's writing has been published more than 40 times in outlets such as Sports Illustrated, the Jerusalem Post, and NBC News. He earned his MBA from the graduate, Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'd be remiss to say, I think many of you know his father, Ernie, was a is a legend uh, in the in the game as a, a player and as a general manager and an executive. Uh, Dan lives in San Francisco. He, has a, he and his wife have a son. If I'm not mistaken, he's got another one on the way, Dan. Um, so we'll understand if you need to rush out early um, today because I think that the due date is soon and he works in venture capital. So Dan, the floor is yours. We really appreciate your time today and an honor to have you. Graham, thank you so much. Thanks for that warm introduction. I really appreciate it. My wife and I are set to, well, my wife has a scheduled delivery on Monday. So we're, we're when you said we're expecting, we're really expecting. So uh, I hope not to have to rush on this call, rush off of this call. If I do, you'll all understand, but I don't anticipate it. We actually had our last OB appointment this morning. So uh, welcoming another baby boy. So fingers crossed. I also want to say hello to the, the guests and friends. Alex Core is a good friend of mine. Dr. Shankman, it's great to know that there's another Cardinal uh, fan supporter on the call. So thank you for joining. My plan today is to talk for about 20 minutes about my family story. Uh, it's as part of my book, you know, by the grace of the game, you know, this book is basically just the story, right? It, and so I want to convey elements of that story to you. And then we could open it up to questions and just kind of have a conversation of it. You've already engaged with Eva Kaur's story, you know, such a inspiration, such, you know, such a heroic story and of Alex's mom. And so I know that you all are kind of familiar with the themes and topics of the Holocaust, forgiveness, survival. And so that's, uh, that's really what my family story is about. Before I tell you that, it's very cool to be talking to a group from the Hoosier State because I talk to a lot of groups, but rarely in the opening kind of comments do you talk so much about basketball, unrelated to my story, right? Quinn Buckner uh, was my dad's teammate at the 1976 Olympics. They played in the NBA together, a good friend of our family. So to hear Quinn being mentioned and to hear basketball and student athletes being talked about, very cool. So let me tell you a bit about my family story, please. If you have questions while I'm speaking, put them in the chat. We can try to get to them then, but certainly when I'm done, would love to just have a conversation about it. So uh, Graham mentioned, you know, my background, played basketball at Stanford, played eight years professionally in leagues all over the world. Uh, basketball is the family business, right? So my dad, Ernie Grunfeld, very well-known person in the world of sports, certainly in the world of basketball. He was a high school basketball All-American out of Queens, New York. He was a college basketball All-American at the University of Tennessee. He formed one of the greatest duos in college basketball history with NBA Hall of Famer Bernard King. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then my dad was a nine-year NBA pro. So I had a very strong NBA career. A little fun fact is my dad played his first exhibition game in Terre Haute, Indiana, and Alex Core was a ball boy at that game. I learned that. <laughs> Alex had to let me know that. But uh, so, yeah, my dad had a very successful career as a player and then was an NBA general manager for 30 years. So he was a general manager of the New York Knicks during the 90s, of the Milwaukee Bucks in the early 2000s, and then of the Washington Wizards for 17 seasons. So there's no one in the game of basketball who doesn't know who my dad is. But what few people know, although more know it now since my book has come out, is that my dad is the only player in NBA history whose parents survived the Holocaust. So both of my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. And in fact, the research suggests that my dad is the only athlete in the history of the major American sports league. So the NBA, the NHL, the NFL, and Major League Baseball. My dad's the only athlete in the history of any of those sports whose parents are Holocaust survivors. You'll all be happy to know my grandmother, who is the star of my family. She's the star of my book. She will turn 97 in June. She lives in the Bay Area, 25 minutes from me and my wife, and uh, she's doing incredibly well. And so our story really starts with her. You know, my family is from Transylvania on the border of Romania and Hungary. And so my grandmother grew up in a house of, there were 10 siblings, 10 including her, two loving parents, an Orthodox Jewish home. And 
Graham knows from my book, but I, I describe what their family life was like before the Holocaust, because now in history, we know the numbers. We know 6 million Jews were killed and millions more, but these people weren't just numbers. They were human beings, right? And they laughed and they loved and they lived lives of purpose. And that's what my family was. And so I, I describe my family members in the book before the war. And my grandmother always talks about how much laughter there was in their house. And, you know, they didn't have technology. You know, they lived in a small village, but they had a lot of love. And so when the Nazis invaded, my grandmother happened to be visiting an older sister in Budapest. And they got a letter from my great grandfather when the Nazis invaded that said, come home immediately. And so my grandmother and her, there was another sister there as well. My grandmother and two sisters, they packed their suitcases. And right before they were set to leave for the train station the next day, they got another letter from my grandfather that said, if you can stay where you are. And my, grand, my great grandfather was my, uh, my grandmother's hero. They were so close. And that was the last correspondence that my grandma ever had with her dad. He was taken to Auschwitz. He was never heard from again. And uh, his name was Solomon Samuel. My son's name is Solomon, named after him. And, you know, that that's, you know, so my grandma says to this day, that second letter telling her to stay in Budapest is what's kept her from Auschwitz because she had a chance to survive. She thinks that my great grandfather realized that his daughter's would have a better chance of blending in in a big city as opposed to their village where everyone knew who they were. So my grandmother had a chance to survive on the run. And if any of you are familiar with Holocaust history, you may have heard of a Swedish diplomat named Raoul Wallenberg. So the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., it's on Raoul Wallenberg Way. He is regarded as one of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust, credited for saving roughly 100,000 Jews in Budapest. And my grandmother was one of them, but Wallenberg saved her life twice. And so the first way is he issued protective passports to, to Jews in Budapest. And so my grandma was able to get one for herself, but she also risked her life to obtain 17 passes for other people. So I would say my grandma is not only my hero, which she is, she is also a hero. And uh, eventually that passport was no longer recognized because of a change in government. My grandmother was captured by the Nazis. She was placed in the Budapest ghetto and she was reunited with one of her brothers there. And at the end of the war, they saw Nazis with machine guns enter the ghetto and word quickly spread that they were there to kill the remaining 80,000 Jews in the ghetto. And so my grandmother and her brother raced up the stairs of, a, of, the, of a build, the building they were sleeping in. They found a small attic space. They hid in there. My grandmother, as she describes it, there was room for about four or five people, but like sardines, they were crammed in there 12 or more, and they waited for 10 minutes and then 20 minutes and then an hour and nothing happened. Eventually, someone went to check and the Nazis had retreated. The ghetto was clear. Soon they were liberated. And my grandma never asked why. She never asked how. She just knew that she was free. Uh, that was in 1945. So 40 years later, in 1985, my grandmother was living in the Bay Area. My dad was this big basketball star in the United States. A movie was made of Raul Wallenberg's life. Richard Chamberlain played Wallenberg. And of course, my grandmother had the date circled on her calendar because she knew Wallenberg had saved her. It was in that movie. One of the final scenes that she saw was an order to kill the Jews in the ghetto, an order by Adolf Eichmann, who you probably know, one of the most notorious Nazis in history. It was Wallenberg who got in his car, raced to the gates of the ghetto, confronted the general and said, let these innocent people go. You'll, you'll be a murderer. The war is over. Let these people go. And he convinced the general to call off the massacre. So it took my grandmother 40 years to learn that Wallenberg saved her life, not just once, but twice during the war. And so I speak to a, group, a lot of groups of young folks and I tell them, you know, if you want to know what a true hero is, just Google Raul Wallenberg. You know, he, not Jewish, just he saw people who needed help. He risked his life. He ultimately lost his life to help those people. He was apprehended by the Russians after the war, never seen again. It's unfortunately relevant today when we turn on the news and see what's happening. But we have examples of people throughout history who have stood up for what's right, who have, you know, done, you know, done it out of the goodness of their heart because it's just simply the right thing to do as a human being. And Wallenberg is certainly one of them. And so that's how my grandmother survived. You know, when she got back to her home, which I mentioned was filled with love and laughter, it was empty completely looted, all, all the people gone, all the objects gone. There was a big farm, big you know, gardens, all of it destroyed. She had no idea what happened to her family. So she would learn that both of her parents 
and five of her siblings were killed. And my grandfather, who I haven't spoken about yet, he lost everyone. So both of his sisters, his parents, he lost everyone. So uh, a lot of people, you know, people know my grandparents survived. And my grandfather, by the way, during the war was in a forced labor camp in Hungary. So he had it easier than my grandmother. Not easy, of course, because you're a prisoner during the Holocaust, but uh, he, he had it easier. And people know that my grandparents survived the war. And yet here's my dad, the sports star in America. How do you connect the dots? Where did it all happen? How did it happen? Because that's where did your grandparents even meet? And so I answered that question honestly. The day my grandmother got home from surviving, one of her brothers had survived and he was already home. And all my grandmother had was a blue overcoat and a thin cotton dress that she was wearing for you know months in the Budapest ghetto in the freezing cold. And her brother said, you know, we need to get you some clothes. I made friends with someone uh, in the labor camp who is from this area. He opened up a store nearby because they had been liberated for several months. He goes, let's take you to get some new clothes. So it was the day my grandmother got back from surviving the Holocaust that she walked through the doors of my grandfather's fabric uh, clothing store. So they met, you know, after the war, Jews wanted to rebuild, you know, all that was lost. They met, they married, they started a family. My uncle was born not long after. And then eight years later, my dad was born. So mentioned my dad's past, you know, as a basketball person, very well known. Uh, he was born under communism in Romania. And, uh, you know, I mentioned my uncle eight years older than him. It took my family more than a decade to flee communism. Uh, and uh, initially they were bound for Israel. So the state of Israel paid for each Jew that Romania would allow to leave. And so my, my family had passports to Israel. I won't get into all the details now, but uh, you can read it in my book about uh, how my grandparents smuggled all their illegal money out of Romania. So, you know, you're not allowed to have money in communism, but they transacted on the black market to save up quite a bit of Romanian money, but also American dollars, which were very risky and dangerous. They had friends who were jailed, tortured or killed for having illegal money. But uh, my grandparents said, listen, we, we need to start a life. We need to figure out how to get this money out. So without any spoilers, they got every cent of their money out of the country. The American dollars were smuggled out for them by one of the biggest American celebrities at the time, one of the most well-known comedians in the United States. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. So uh, you, you could read to, to figure out how that happened, but suffice it to say, it took a lot for them to get themselves out, to get some of their money out. But they spent six months in Rome before you know, they're initially going to Israel, but at the last minute, they had a chance to go to the United States. And in 1964, they arrived in New York City. And so uh, they're already living the American dream at that point, right? My, to survive the Holocaust, to endure communism, to be able to leave. And now you're in the United States of America. You have a chance to work for a living, for your kids to get an education. By the way, my grandparents weren't able to get an education because of the Holocaust, right? Now their boys can go to school. They can be free. This is already the American dream. A few months after arriving in the United States, my uncle, who I mentioned, eight years older than my dad, uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. And just so you know, my dad, what my dad called my uncle in Hungarian, translates in English to my king. So imagine a little brother looking up to his big brother and calling him my king. Uh, my uncle was diagnosed with leukemia and he passed away within a year. And so after all the tragedy, you know, for my grandparents to lose their oldest son and for my dad to lose his hero and his big brother it's probably it's the biggest tragedy you know that ever happened to my family it's a hole that can't be filled I mentioned that my son is named after my great-grandfather I'm named after my uncle my middle name is Leslie that was his American name his Hungarian you know they called him Lutzi and so that's some an obligation that I feel that I you know take very seriously and um, so here was my dad son of Holocaust survivors lost his big brother, didn't speak English, so was made fun of because he didn't speak the language, had never touched a basketball. And so he went to the park in New York City to make friends, to learn English, to heal from that loss. And he started playing, playing hoops. And uh, he says to me, you know, that's how you made friends in the neighborhood. You played basketball. He said, you met people. He said, the better you were, the more friends you made. And so I can look at him and say, well, you must have made a lot of friends because, you know, sometimes things just click. And I, I don't think my dad would have flown so high, so far, so fast if he wasn't, if the game wasn't taking him away from all that pain, right? The Holocaust, fleeing his homeland, losing his brother. But then here's basketball and he was good at it. 
but you know a lot of people are good at a game he became a phenomenon he became an apps in college in high school he was a superstar i had someone reach out to me recently because you know my dad's a new york city basketball legend and someone reached out about my book and they said i just i grew up hearing about your dad because my dad would always talk about him and my dad said outside of kareem abdul jabbar your dad is the best high school basketball player he ever saw i told my dad that it made him pretty happy <laughs> to, to even be in the same sentence as kareem but um, yeah, I think it's because of what, what basketball was taking him away from. And so I'll show you my book again, right? By the grace of the game. It was really the game that, that saved my dad, that gave my family a, a new future in America. So despite, you know, the, the success that my dad was having, even early on with basketball, my grandparents didn't, didn't see him play until he was a junior in high school, 17 years old. They opened up, they had opened up a fabric store in the Bronx, you know, they're working six, seven days a week to build a life and also to distract themselves from the loss of my uncle. Right. And then they got a call at their store for my dad's high school coach who said, you know, my grandmother answered, he said, Mrs. Grunfeld, you, you, you want to see your son play basketball. You, you need to see this. And so the reason they had never been to a game is because my dad's games were in the early afternoon and they would have had to close their fabric store to watch. Them. They're immigrants, Holocaust survivors. They're not closing their store, right? This is their livelihoods. But the next week after getting the call, they closed their store early, but not early enough, right? Because they, <laughs> they had to keep working. So when they got to the gym, it was a winter. Uh, gym was gym was closed, and the usher at the door said, "Listen, the game and the game had already started." So he said, "Gym is full. You know, we can't let you in." And my grandparents' English wasn't very good. My grandfather said, "You know, we're parents of player, uh, guests of coach." But the usher said, "Listen, nothing we can do. I'm sorry." My grandmother still tells the story. She kind of steadied herself, and she said. Our son is our son's name is Ernie Grunfeld. And his eyes lit up and he said, well, why didn't you say that? And he opened the door and he brought him into the gym. And this was their first time, you know, in a gym like this, seeing my dad play. And they were looking around and my grandpa nudged my grandmother with his elbow. And in Hungarian, he said, well, if Ernie's such a good player, why isn't he on the court? And my grandmother was shocked. She said, look right there. That's Ernie. And she pointed to the middle of the floor. And it's so symbolic. My grandpa could not recognize my dad. Literally that transformation had happened before his eyes, right? From an at-risk immigrant youth in the United States of America who had lost his brother, now the tables had turned. And, he, and again, this is the Hoosier State. We have basketball fans here. You know, like between the lines, you know, there, that's where you know, a lot of things happen and the power dynamic had shifted. And uh, my grandpa used to make my dad come to their fabric store every weekend to work. And on the court, after that game, he said, you never come to the store again. You just work on your basketball. We'll take care of the rest. And so a year later, he was an All-American, one of the most highly recruited players in the country, went to the University of Tennessee. He was a four-time All-SEC selection there. He graduated as the, team, the school's all-time leading scorer and the, the second leading scorer in the history of the SEC. This is a good trivia question. To this day, my dad is the fifth leading scorer in the history of the SEC. That was 1977. To this day, he's the fifth leading scorer. So he was an absolute legendary player there. He teamed with Bernard King, you know, who, you know, they were called the Ernie and Bernie show. They each averaged more than 25 points per game one year. Uh, they, yeah, they were both, you know, Bernard is a black man from Brooklyn, New York. My dad is this white immigrant from Queens, New York. They go down to Tennessee. They become legends separately and together. Uh, my dad was the 11th pick in the NBA draft, had a successful nine-year career, but he was more of a role player. Bernard King was still remained a superstar. He led the league in scoring. Uh, my dad and Bernard actually played with each other in the NBA for the New York Knicks. So, And Bernard lived up the street from us. So to this day, I call him Uncle B. He calls me Danny Boy. Uh, he actually texted me uh, a month ago just to tell me that he was proud of me, you know, because the book is doing so well. The story is really impacting people. So also, and you, you can read about it in the book, but also a commentary on what basketball can do, how it could bring people together. Because although Bernard and my dad are from the same city, they're from very different places, you know, and, and now they're friends forever. They built this history together. And so, yeah, my dad, you know, successful NBA career. Then he was an NBA general manager for 30 years. You know, I mentioned that he was the general manager of the Knicks during the 90s, and they had the, all these battles with the Indiana Pacers in the playoffs. So, you know, Reggie Miller, Rick Smith, Mark Jackson, Dale Davis, Antonio Davis. I'm sure many of you remember those guys. I was flying to Indiana for those playoff games. So a lot of good memories there. And uh, yeah, listen, it's the game that changed the, the trajectory of my family. In my book, I also detail my journey because I grew up so differently than my grandparents, of course, than my, than my dad. 
that's what every grandparent and parent wants for their kids is to have more opportunities, more resources. And I had those things, but I also carried this history with me, knowing that I have ancestors who didn't get a chance to live out their dreams, knowing that what basketball did for my family, what it helped my dad overcome. Um, it, listen, I, and I mentioned Quinn Buckner in the 1976 Olympics. You know, my dad, his junior year at Tennessee, became an Olympic gold medalist for the United States of America, roughly 10 years after coming to America, not speaking the language, not to, having not such a basketball, losing his brother. Then he becomes a gold medalist, right? And my grandparents now closed their store for two weeks and they drove from Queens, New York to Montreal, Canada and got to watch my dad have a gold medal placed around his neck, right? Again, I'll show you my book, By the Grace of the Game. You know, that's, that's the only way a story like this is really possible. And so I, I carry this history. I was always very motivated determined, ambitious as a basketball player, not just because I wanted to live up to my dad's success, although that's definitely part of it, but also because, you know, my grandparents survived the Holocaust, you know, and, and I write in depth in the book that, you know, I played basketball at Stanford. I was an academic All-American there at Grand Mention. I'm proud of those things, but I wanted to go to Stanford from the time I was in seventh grade because my grandma lives 25 minutes from campus and my grandma loved to go to school. She loved to learn, but she didn't get a chance to get an education because of the war. So you know, that, so the success I had as a student there, there was a purpose behind that, right? I had a chance to go to Stanford and I made that happen through a combination of luck, skill, timing, it all, you know, it also worked out for you, but I made that childhood dream come true. You could read about it in my book. It was very dramatic. I, uh, I had one game, you know, that were one, the, the end of the summer where I was very close uh, to making it happen. And I had the best game I ever had in my life, hands down. And, you know, the word grace is part of my book title, but there is something kind of cosmic and spiritual about this story, right? Just how much basketball has done for us. And so for me to get to Stanford, to be by my grandmother for four years uh, is just so, so special. But yeah, so, you know, my, my history is different, but at the same time, I, I carry what my ancestors, my, my grandparents, my dad, you know, have been through. And so that's, that's the story I tell. And I'm uh, really, honored truly to share it with you all some of you might have heard of my dad in passing just as a basketball guy right but uh and the interesting thing is in this book you know I was on Good Morning America not long ago I was on the NBA on TNT where like Shaq and Charles Barkley are talking about this like there's been a lot of buzz about this the story is unfortunately relevant given what given what's happening around the world I think now it's it's more important than ever although it's always been important but what, as it relates to my dad, people then, oh, like Ernie Grunfeld, like he just sounds like a New Yorker. You know, if you hear him in interviews, he's just a New York guy. People don't know his native language is Hungarian and this whole story, but he doesn't talk about it much publicly. And I talk a lot in my book about privilege and I'm privileged in a lot of ways. And one of them is that I have a generation of separation. You know, I can look back on the story. I can reflect upon it. I can draw inspiration from it, but my dad doesn't have that luxury. You know, he never had grandparents. They were killed in Auschwitz in the gas chambers. You know, his brother, his brother passed away when he got to the United States, you know, and, and so that's and basketball took him away from those things. But I have the luxury of going back and, you know, again, drawing on this history. And so uh, he's very proud of me for writing the book and he's grateful that I've done it. But it's been hard for him because it's it's a difficult history. But then the last thing I'll leave you with and then I'd love to have a conversation or take any questions. There's definitely darkness in my family story, but there's so much more light. And it, it's true. And, you know, the, I've always had such a sense of inspiration, knowing what my grandparents overcame, knowing what my dad overcame. And I hope that when people read this story, they have a similar sense of inspiration and a hopeful feeling. And all the feedback I've gotten is that is that is what you go through. And it's it's important that we know about the Holocaust and know what happened there. But at the end of the day, I think we all we all need something to believe in. We especially nowadays, you could all, always use a hopeful, inspirational, happy story. And even though there's things in here that are hard. This is a hopeful, happy, and inspirational story. So with that, let me open it up. If there are any questions, would, would love to, to chat, to field them. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Uh, Dan, Dan. That was oh. so I was just gonna say that was tremendous and uh, been in this, been a Kiwani for about 20 years. This is, this is one of the top presentations I've heard. We are gonna open it up for questions. Carol, I'm gonna first lead with Greg's. Greg had the first, Question: Greg Silver here, who's also been really involved with what we've done with Mrs. Core. Uh, he asked, "What attributes provided your family to survive, and um, and are Jews, others, 
surviving likewise now in the Ukraine? I guess what are the what are the elements that that really help them survive? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for that. So my grandma is extraordinarily disciplined, savvy. She has will. You know everything you would need to get through a crisis. She has. You know she's she's book smart. She's street smart. Again, she's so disciplined. Like she, if, if she sets her mind to something, she does it. She and we've talked a lot about. You know what what was it right? Like what got you through? And so she has every quality that you could hope for. She also has an incredible amount of perspective and humility because the first thing she'll say is luck. She said, you could have all of that stuff, all the, all the things she had, all the things she did, you could have all that. But at that point in time, it didn't matter. You know, you needed luck and you needed help. And she had those things. So I mentioned Wallenberg, right? Wallenberg is one of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust. If you read my book, you'll read about someone who gave my grandmother an extra pair of pants when she was freezing in Budapest about a general who snuck a couple meals to her. You know, they're, they're, they're just all these acts of kindness over the course of the story. So she had everything she needed to, she had the will, she, she, had, she was a fighter. She is to this day, 97 in June, doing amazing. She is the, the most incredible person. And if you've never met a Holocaust survivor, you'll read my book and you'll know one. You know, and, and I'll say the same for, for Eva Kaur, right? If you've never met one, watch her movie, You'll, you'll know what these people are made of. And it's truly, it's, it's incredible. Um, but yeah, but all that being said, she had help, she had luck, you know, and that, that's what it took. Today, what's happening, I think for everyone is just extraordinarily upsetting, unthinkable what we're seeing, these images we're seeing. For me, it's very visceral, you know, because they're almost, I wrote scenes like this in my book. I write about my grandmother hiding in a basement with all these terrified Jews and their bombs going off. Actually, I'll tell you, um, someone asked me what a moment, a real moment of beauty in my book. And there are a lot of them, but one, and you, you can read about this, but as they were bombing Budapest and my grandmother's hiding in basements with bombs going off and dead body. I mean, this, what my grandma's eyes have seen, no one's eyes have seen, but one night, there were, there were all these Jews with her hiding in a basement. And someone said, we, everyone come out, you have to see this. The allies, cause you know, there, there was real war at that point. They dropped flares to light up Budapest to be able to see, you know, where they wanted to, what kind of maneuvers they wanted to make. And they were like fireworks. And my grandmother says that, you know, everyone was dirty and scared and hungry, but for a moment we saw beauty, you know, these fire, like these, she calls them golden chandeliers. And I write that in my book and it sounds really good, but it was from her. She used this beautiful phrasing to describe it, right? Um, and so even in these darkest moments, there are there is beauty there. And I think if you look around the world at all the good people who are trying to help, donating time, donating money, risking their own lives, people going to the borders and in the Jewish community, there are, I, I read something, something someone posted somewhere about, if you're in, if you, there's a Jewish person in the Ukraine, whoever you are, wherever you are, we will help you. We will find you. You know, there are so many good, decent people in the world who are trying to help right now. And your heart breaks to see what these people are going through. It's, it's unthinkable. It's horrific. And there is a lot of light and a lot of goodness. And, and so hopefully it prevails. Uh, before I get to Carol, you have a comment uh, uh, yeah. that hopefully makes makes it onto Amazon. Uh, Chris Schinkman says food plays a big role in the book and I'm impressed with your knowledge and spelling of food names. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, go mm -hmm. card, by the way. Um, food plays a huge role in my book. My grandmother, we all have biases, right? My grandma's like the most amazing cook in the world. She is, she's just very, very gifted in the kitchen. She has the magic touch. Yeah, the food are Hungarian, so they do, they are spelled kind of atypically, uh, but it's more than just food. And, and we all can relate to the experience of congregating with family over food, right? It's, it's how we kind of connect with each other. And certainly in my family, it's been a big connector. But when I say to my grandmother, and I call my grandma Anyu, which means mother in Hungarian. So I'll say, Anyu, you, you're the best cook in the world. And she says, that's because you never had my mother's cooking. So my <laughs> great grandmother, before she was killed in Auschwitz, made these meals for my grandmother. And so it's not just food, it's love, it's history, it's legacy. And so, um, yeah, food is, 
it, it's the taste is outrageous. I write in the book how I eat myself sick from my grandmother's food, which is 100% true. I've done it more times than, than I should admit. It's so good, I can't stop eating it, but it's more than just cuisine. You know, it, it's, it's yeah, it, it means a lot. And so uh, I was lucky that again, when I was at Stanford, my grandmother lives 25 minutes away. So not only did she come to every single home game I played, but she was at my dorm every Sunday to drop off my clean laundry, pick up my dirty laundry and stock my fridge. Uh, my roommates, she cleaned their rooms too. I would tell her, Anya, you don't have to clean their room. And she would say, if you live here, it all has to be clean. I said, do, do what you need to do. But they also ate really well. So yeah, food, food is, is a big part of it. Carol, I think you had a question. I'd like to know, um, tell us once again, how we can get our hands on this book. I'm, I'm eager to, to do so and, and, and to read about, read about everything you've told us today. We're Thank you so much. Uh, Go ahead, Dan. So I'll, here, I'll let you fill in in just one second. Uh, it's available. The book's done really well, which is great, but it's also frustrating because supply, you know, varies. Amazon has it in all its forms. Actually, I'll tell this group this a little inside info. Amazon is the only place who still has the hardcover, but and there's a paperback printing six months in advance, which is really cool. So hardcover, paperback, audiobook, Kindle, it's all there on Amazon. Um, and I think what Graham is going to say is there's a bulk order can be placed. So if there is, you know, if you all get together and say, hey, we'd like, you know, 20, 30 copies as a group, we could get you a nice discount on that through the publisher. And so that those options are all there as well. Yeah, I, again, I'd really like to support this book and Dan coming on here. Um, generally, I think you get paid for these type of things and we've got Dan at no cost. So I really like to support his book. Um, and again, you can do that by sending an email. To Kelly and Kelly, if we can also um, promote this in the in the newsletter next week, I would appreciate that. Grandma, I, I spoke recently and someone said, Dan is an amazing freelance speaker, but the key word is free, <laughs> you know, and I laugh and uh, I don't do that. This isn't about money. You know, this is about a story that's in my heart. It's bigger than me. And so, you know, I don't ask if people offer me honorary, they offer me money. I don't accept it. I say, please take that money and and buy books because I want people to read this story. I want them to buy it for their grandkids. You know, I, I had a, a rabbi who I've become friends with through this process. He told me, you know, I read your book. I was so moved. I bought a copy for my 80 year old dad and my 11 year old nephew. So like that, and I was thought that was really cool. So I would just urge you all like, to, if you want to support like, yeah, gift copies to people who you think would be inspired by this book, who could learn from it. Um, it would mean a lot to me. So thank you all for, for that interest. I appreciate it. Dan, you're doing better than I have. With my book, I've had to pay people to listen to me <laughs> speak about mine. We all start some, We all start there, man. Believe me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I think we've got. You've got to jump off at twelve fifty. Are you okay to take a couple more questions? Yeah, I can. I can go till twelve fifty-five. Okay. Yep. I've got two. Um, the first one alludes at something you just said. One of the things I was really pleased with about the movie we did for Alex's mom is that ultimately an educational toolkit was developed out of that that went basically all around this state. And I, I know you know this, Dan, and probably many on this call, you know, they've done uh, surveys about how few young people know about the Holocaust. And I'm not, I'm not talking about 10 year olds, I'm talking like 18, 20, 22 year olds. You know, Dan, this story is educational, but also I think about your dad as a role model for young children. Do, do you have any thoughts on expanding this to an educational tool for, for younger people? It, it, it'd be a dream. I'm talking to some schools. I've had some interest. I would love this to be taught in schools. One thing about my book that I've been really heartened by is like it's accessible right? Because there's a really fun basketball story. By the way, like, you'll probably cry when you read my book, you'll definitely laugh. Because that's what life is. We do both those things, you know, and that's, and so there's a lot of fun and funny and interesting moments. So it, it's an accessible way to access the history of the Holocaust. I would love, if any of you are teachers or no teachers, like have them reach out. Like, that's, that's the hope. And the data that you referenced is staggering to know how little, and like you said, it's not 10 year olds, millennials. So that's my age, you know, born 1981 or later and Gen Z. So a little bit younger, their knowledge of the Holocaust, it, it's, yeah, it's really, really upsetting how little folks know. And so for 
that's one of my dreams with this book is like, yeah, you tell a really interesting basketball story, but you'll also expose this history. So I hope that, you know, this does come to fruition with schools to be able to teach it because I think it'd be really important. And I think it's a way to, to reach people who need to know this history. Because by the way, what we're seeing on the news today, like this is what humans are capable of, ripping families apart, killing innocent people, this destruction, like the only way to prevent things like this from happening are to talk about it, share stories, educate. If we don't know our history, we're bound to repeat it. So I hope my book plays a part in that. The other question I had, and I am a basketball junkie and I know all about your dad and Bernie. Uh, Bernie, um, Bernard King, I, I'm curious, how did they get away to Tennessee? <laughs> two, two New Yorkers who probably yeah. were recruited by everybody in the country and you had so many great programs in the Northeast and St. John's, Tom Crowley's waving his hand. Tom, by the way, also coached at Stanford. I should, should mention that, Dan. But I'm just curious how, how they got to Tennessee from New York. A guy named Ray Mears. There you go. The head yeah. coach of Tennessee and he was quite a showman and a recruiter. And to talk to kids out of New York City who were as good as it gets. Uh, Danny, I played against your dad and, and Bernie. I played, when, when, uh, I played them in, in, um, in a Christmas tournament in 1975 in uh, New Orleans. We led the whole game. That's when you were at Penn? Yeah, they caught us at the end. And Grunfeld got 36. Your dad had 36. King was in trouble. As you know, he had sort of a troubled past, especially in he college. He some issues. Yeah. And he, he, they both, they tore us apart. We couldn't, couldn't stop. My him. dad. But it was Ray Mears. That, that yeah. Ray, that's what I would say. That, thank you. That my dad talks about the Palestra and, uh, you know, they recruited him and uh, he loved the program at Penn. And that was actually, I think it was one of his final 10 schools. So he, he really thought about yeah. Penn. He liked it a lot, but uh, that's very cool. Right. Yeah. 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 We, so he. We could, we could never get him to visit is the story that we, I heard when I got to campus. Yeah, I don't think he took an official there because I, <laughs> I, I really go into detail in my book about like where he went and but when he talks about that. Who'd you play for? I played for Fred Dumpy and Bob Weinhauer. Okay. Um, very cool. Well, my you know how it is as like I'll I'll call my dad today and I'll I'll mention we spoke. I'll say, Do you remember your game against Penn? And before well, I finish, he, might, he'll, he had 36. He won't remember me. I can tell you that. <laughs> A hundred percent, he'll say I had 36. That's the first thing he'll say. Like, he, he like, you, you'd be, it's just amazing. He, you know how it is when you play, like, you just remember every detail from every game. So, uh, thank you for sharing a, that. What a player! Oh my god, thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, like, what I said, like, he was a solid NBA player and he was a really oh, yeah. well known executive. So, people don't know about his, like, he was a phenomenon in college and high school, like, he was just like extraordinary. And so, uh, Ray Mears, as you mentioned, you're hundred percent right. Like they basically, the staff, like they moved to New York for a bit to just like get these guys and Stu Aberdeen, who uh, you the might assistant. remember Tom was the assistant. He was, he was the guy and he would go to my grandparents fabric store during the day. He'd be at my dad's high school when he got out. Like, and back then players from New York were going down South. They called it the pipeline to the South. And so, yeah, it just, you know, they both felt comfortable there and uh, they did some really special things. Eric has a no, or Trita has a really good thought on, let's add three more copies here. Dan, you're selling these books by the minute here. Let's add three <laughs> let's copies. Let's auction them off. Let's get, um, <laughs> I, I'll just tell everyone here, like through my publisher, we can get them for roughly $10 a pop, which is a huge discount. So uh, yeah, I would just, again, if you, you know, I know graduation's coming up for kids. I know Father's Day, Mother's Day, like anything you could do to spread the story is just so meaningful for me. So thank you. And those three, uh, one of them is going to go to Quinn Buckner. I don't know if he has the book yet, but he uh, helped us out. We did a banquet last week celebrating the finalists for the um, Indiana Basketball State Tournament, and Quinn helps us out a lot. So, Please, give, like, Quinn. Actually, I write about Quinn in the book because I write about the yeah. Olympics, you know, and my dad making the Olympic team was so much bigger, right, because being an immigrant, the Holocaust, et cetera, but I write about their experience playing for Dean Smith, and so – Quinn has been always good to me over the years as well, not aside from being a, a good friend of our family. So very meaningful. Thank you. Yep. Let's add that to the tally, Kelly. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, Roger asked, and, and Dan, I think your kids are too young perhaps for this question, but how do your children being another generation away 
receive these stories and understand how fortunate they are. Maybe that's a question to project into the future because I think we've got Which one I, on the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my son will turn three next week. <laughs> and then his his baby brother will arrive next week, uh, which is awesome. We're fingers crossed and excited. But listen, like they can read this, you know, this is it. The history lives in here. And, and that's that's the most meaningful to be able to one day hand it to my children. They can know what their great, great grandparents went through, what their great grandparents, you know, like to know this history. It, it's it's so important. And my grandma always says, if we don't tell these stories, no one else will. You know, and so when I do talk to young groups, I tell them like, know your history, interview your grandparents, interview your parents. You're gonna, you know, you don't have, your grandparents didn't have to survive the Holocaust and flee and all this dramatic stuff like happened with my family. We all have stories, we all have histories. I think it's really important to know them. And so, yeah, my, my kids will read the book. I'll talk to them about it and I'll encourage them to talk about the Holocaust with other people because forever people need to be talking about it because we, we have to make sure that we know the history. We have time for one more question. Okay, uh, last couple notes before I thank Dan. Um, I, I, this is all about his book, but I will say the book I've got coming out in October, I'm dedicating to Eva Kaur because one of the, the programs we profile in the new book is Davidson College. And um, the coach there took his team in 2018 to Auschwitz. Very unique, you know, how many coaches do that? and. Bob McKillop's a friend of Alex and I, and um, so the book is being dedicated to Eva. I will also mention, because um, this is what I do at Butler, um, there is a scholarship we have in Eva Kaur's name here at Butler that supports our Peace and Conflict Studies program, and we're proud to, to carry on her name. And if you haven't seen the film, um, I highly encourage you to. But I, I can't thank Dan enough. I know he's very busy, certainly professionally, but also really personally right now, and we thank him for his time. We're making a donation, and I apologize, Trina. I don't have the organization in front of me where we're making a donation in his name. Are you here on the call? Yeah, I think she is. Trina? Um, actually, hold on. Uh, okay, kid, sorry, Kids Voice of Indiana. Uh, whose mission is to serve Indiana's children and families by providing legal education, child advocacy, and family visitation through their programs. Dan, we're making a uh, donation in your honor. Thank you. Again, thank you. Can't thank you enough. What a um, wonderful presentation. Let's support the book by sending a note to Kelly, and um, we certainly wish you all the best on Monday. Really grateful. Thank you again to, to Alex and Tom and all my, my friends who who uh, I guess who joined here. I'm just really grateful for that. And thank you for supporting the book. Uh, please like connect with me. I'm everywhere, like Twitter, Facebook, you know, I have a book website, dangrunkel.com. So, and I truly mean that I'd love to connect with folks who care about the story or are moved by it. So I hope we can, you know, potentially stay in touch and just, yeah, Graham, thanks for this. They, before we started, they said that Graham always picks good guests. So don't break the chain. So I felt the pressure, you know, cause I say you, you know how to pick them. So, uh, it was, I would just appreciate you kind of bringing me on here. It was awesome. Graham, I'd, I'd like to thank you for bringing us this fantastic speaker and his wonderful presentation. I think all of us have a, at least on an intellectual level, knowledge of the um, atrocities that were committed during the Nazi era. But to hear the, um, the inspirational and beautiful story of Dan's family is just it it brings it to another level and opens our hearts and minds to um to what so many people suffered during that period of time uh thank you dan so thank much you. um I, I just i was just spellbound by by the story of your family and the and the the the, the beauty of 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 what your ancestors accomplished and the wonderful fact that your grandmother is still living and you have the, you have that wonderful opportunity to be with her. Thank um, you. Thank so, you. Um, I, Thank I you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. I'm really, really grateful. And uh, yeah, I hope you all can, you know, get a chance to read the book and engage even deeper with the story. Please tell your friends and family. And yeah, it was just really wonderful to be able to share with you. Thank you all.
Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. We'll, let you, we'll let you go. I know you got a 1255 and I'm going to let Carol close this out. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks Alex, again, Dan. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. And a donation will be made, as uh, I think Graham told you, um, in your honor to the Kids Voice of Indiana. Their mission is to serve Indiana's kids and families by providing legal education, child advocacy, and family visitation through our programs. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And thank you, thank you, Dan, for a beautiful program. And thank you, Graham, for bringing him to us. And we'll see you at our next meeting. I think, I'm not sure when that is. We'll have to depend on Kelly for that information. Have a wonderful end of your week, everyone, and a beautiful weekend.